testing is done, they can bring the microphone to you and then we'll continue that process. So I think that will make it easier for our sergeant at arms and it'll also give me a clue that you, the, the next contestant, knows that you're next and you are also in the back of the room to be minded. All right, I think I've done enough housekeeping. I've done that enough times to be able to give us a chance to get back into the room. We are now ready for our second contest, and this is the International Speech Contest. In my 17-year career with Toastmasters International, this is the contest where I've seen people join Toastmasters specifically so they could become the world champion of public speaking. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't do speeches in the clubs, beyond the CC. Sometimes they didn't take on leadership roles because they were so focused on becoming the world champion of public speaking. Yet I say that to say this, this is the division level. We know after this contest we go to the district level and then from there we have two more levels for this particular contest. So we know this contest is going to be what? Good. <laughs> this contest is going to be good. There's a lot at stake here. I've already asked if you can make certain that your mobile devices are on site. Did you guys get a chance to do that? Yeah, yeah. Look at your neighbor and just say, give them the look. Did you? Mm -hmm. All right, good. So your neighbors have done that. Awesome. Now, members of the audience, please refrain from leaving in and out the room. Same applies as we did with the Table Topics contest, meaning we want our contestants to have uninterrupted amount of time. So that means if you have to take a break, do so during the minute of silence. Yet do keep in mind, if a contestant is up here speaking, you will not be able to enter or leave the room until the speaking space is clear. Sound fair enough? Yes. Awesome. Now, let's go through our speaking order. You have your agenda before you? Yep. Yes. Let me give you our speaking order. <laughs> Contestant number one will be Mandy Shaw. Mandy Shaw is contestant number one. Contestant number two will be Eric Tiarina. Eric Tiarina will be contestant number two. <coughs> Contestant number three will be Paramita Bannock. Paramita Bannock will be contestant number three. Contestant number four will be Ying Manin. Ying Manin will be contestant number four. Contestant number five will be Carrie Coleman. Carrie Coleman will be contestant number five. And contestant number six will be Yvette Beasley. Yvette Beasley will be contestant number six. We will have one minute of silence in between each one of our speakers. Our speakers will be allowed a five to seven minute speaking time. They will see the green card or light at five minutes, the yellow card or light at six minutes, and the red card and light at seven minutes. We have already briefed them on their speaking space. In addition to being briefed have been our timers, our ballot counters, and everyone else that are functionaries for tonight's contest. Keep in mind, after each contestant has spoken, we need one minute of silence. One minute of silence. That way, our judges will be able to mark their ballot. Are you ready to get this contest going? Yes. A few years ago, I lost my best friend. His name was Robert Masterson. I referred to him as Old Man. Old Man died at the age of 72 due to complications with heart surgery. 
Before he passed, however, Old Man and his lovely wife, Zelda, celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. I was privileged to attend. I remember wishing that my own marriage would last that long. My parents enjoyed a long marriage. They were married in Mexico in 1949. They had a total of eight children. I happened to be the youngest. I remember my mother also struggling with heart issues during her lifetime. She also had diabetes and it complicated things. In 1996, my mother passed away and my father buried her on their 47th wedding anniversary. I've been privileged to be married for almost 25 years to my lovely wife, Valerie. This year we celebrate our silver anniversary. We met at a 7-Eleven, and I always say, thank heaven for 7-Eleven. <laughs> we have two children, my oldest, Lucas, and my youngest is Maya, who happened to be joining us today. For our 20th anniversary, my wife and I took a trip to Las Vegas. During this time, the temperature was a scorching 114 degrees. We did a lot of walking during that time. And I remember from all that walking and the intense heat, I started to feel a little burning in my chest. I thought it'd go away. It wasn't like a Fred G. Sanford, here I come Elizabeth. <laughs> Unfortunately, for me, what happened in Vegas didn't stay in Vegas. Back, back in Chicago, as I'm walking to work, I start feeling that burning in my chest as I walk uphill again. It felt kind of like a heartburn. Later, I would even feel it walking downhill as I approached a bus stop. I mentioned it to my, boss, my, my, my physician. He recommended I take a stress test. The stress test led to an angiogram. The angiogram <coughs> led to a quadruple bypass. I had a lot of friends, family joining us and, and hoping I was doing better. They signed my heart and everything, <laughs> and I appreciate it. <laughs> but most importantly, my wife was there. Five days, five nights, she stayed in the, ho in, the, in the hospital with me. And I remember one day waking up only to find her hand holding my hand as she slept in that recliner next to my bed. That's a memory I will carry with me the rest of my life. After being in the hospital for a week, my daughter welcomed me home with a message out of the driveway. My son signed it at the bottom trying to take credit for her work. <laughs> I don't know what you do, but for me, I did a whole lot of contemplation at that time. And I came across this Bible verse that seemed specific to my particular situation. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And it made a lot of sense to me. I said, yeah, the heart's important. But then as I read the chapter, Proverbs chapter 4, it's not talking about that part of your body and your chest that's pumping blood. It's talking about those desires, those 
aspirations that lead to those decisions that drive the course of our life. I don't know if you believe the Bible. I'm sure in this room there's many different faiths represented. But I think we all agree that there's some wonderful stories in the Bible that we could all relate to and learn from. In particular, the story we all know about Adam and Eve. You know the story well. Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden fruit. Then they became ashamed, sowing fig leaves on themselves. And then, eventually, they even hid from God. And you see three different distinct but interrelated aspects to this story, all stemming from one decision, the physical, the emotional or social, and the spiritual. I also came across this other verse that made an impact on my life. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is an amazing love. In conclusion, I'd like to encourage you, guard your heart, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And I would like to thank you for this opportunity to share some matters of the heart. for the moment of the one minute of silence. Clue, Mr. Tech Master, is this sounding better? Testing, testing, great. It looks as if our third contestant has been mic'd and is ready to go. And it also seems as if our actual mics are ready to go. <laughs> our third contestant is Parameter Bannon. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey, Paramba Bannon. It's about enjoying the journey. 
Madam Countess Chair, fellow Toastmasters and guests. I was the kind of person who was scared to try anything new. I would give up too easily. I would try something only if I knew I would get it right. <laughs> Once I became a parent, I realized that I cannot teach my child how not to give up if I don't practice it myself. High time I did something about it. I started with a basic internet recipe for how not to give up. <laughs> Three simple steps. Step one, have a goal. Step two, start small. And step three, stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> now for the goal. I needed a very compelling goal. Let me tell you how I got that goal. Rewind to 2012. <laughs> My daughter came home with a little gift for mommy on Mother's Day. A cute little plant. Now she didn't know that mommy had killed plants in the past. <laughs> decided to never have a plant in the house again. The plant is here now. Mommy's day gift. I water it religiously for the first three days. <laughs> I set it out on the patio. Clearly out of sight. And out of sight means out of mind. <laughs> By the time I remembered that cute little plant for mommy was already <laughs> dead. <laughs> I felt like the meanest mommy in the whole world. <laughs> a teary-eyed five-year-old mourning a dead plant <laughs> is a strong motivator. <laughs> <laughs> that became my goal. <coughs> Keep a plant alive. <laughs> but I have to start small, don't I? Let's try to keep it alive for one month. One month. And the third step? Stick with it. Stick with it, I did. Three years. of adventures from seeds that never sprouted <laughs> to leaving a poinsett under a heating vent. <laughs> I didn't have much luck. My daughter, who is now eight, she's graduated from so me to oh, mommy, you can also kill an artificial plant, can't you? This year might actually be lucky. of the Real Simple magazine seem to have just the right thing for me. February edition, 2015. Hard to kill houseplants. <laughs> <laughs> I quick flipped over. Your new favorite fast house houseplants. Eight picks from the pros. Wait till you see how picky I was with those picks. Snake plant? Ew, I don't like the name. Spider plant, Rex begonia, too much work. <laughs> Ponytail palm, too unruly. <laughs> Peace lily, mildly toxic. No way. <laughs> Succulents, too unattractive. Easy <laughs> plant, too big. <laughs> Air plant, tiny, needs to be misted, doesn't need to be watered. That I can keep at my work desk. That would not have an out of sight, out of mind episode. <coughs> Just right. <laughs> I beat Goldilocks, didn't I? <laughs> the air plant it was. That's what I went and got. It's been six months, weeks since I got the air plant. And guess what? It is alive! <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> and celebrations. But hang, hang on. Something doesn't seem right. I am here at 
my much awaited destination. But why am I sad that that journey's over? I think I know. Sometime during that journey, I actually started having fun. <laughs> I actually started enjoying the journey. I stopped worrying about the finish line. <clears throat> That's it. That was the secret ingredient that was missing from all my recipes. I did not enjoy the journey. Priceless lesson, isn't it? Sometimes you just need to live it, to experience it, and to understand what it truly means. Enjoy the journey. Nowadays, I remind myself to enjoy <coughs> any journey. I'm grateful for all the forces that work together to teach me what this means. From that 2012 plant to the 2015 plant, and everything in between. <laughs> Do you remember, remember to enjoy your journeys? The metro journey that you have every morning, even if that alarm woke you up, uh, up at an insane hour. <laughs> How about the Toastmasters journey? Even if you still blank out on the daily topic. <laughs> How about life's journey? Even if it can sometimes be so mean. Enjoy the journey. By the way, my daughter thought the plant was really cute and wanted one for herself. I owe her one big time. <laughs> Madam Timers, let's have one minute of silence. Do you have any questions?
my shoes, just like you're going on a job interview. Just like that next day is your first day of class. I sat there in a dark room and I envisioned me running a marathon. Did I train? <laughs> Did I take it serious to the day before? But I showed up and I started running. My five, I felt alive. My eight, I felt great. My 13, I was her team. <laughs> I was hurt. I drank some Gatorade and I kept running. At mile 18, I cried. <laughs> Go to the medical tent. <laughs> Doctor, save me. <laughs> she said, lay down, son. Let me stretch you. She said, you have runner's knee. It's common. To be honest, I wanted her to tell me that I couldn't go on anymore. Because <laughs> I wanted to quit. So I can go on Facebook and type in, Due to technical difficulties, <laughs> I can't go on anymore. <laughs> but being the doctor, she said, son, young man, she gave me that volunteer look like you wasted my time. <laughs> she said, you have a choice to make. You need to quit or keep going. I limped away, drank some more Gatorade. <laughs> I am a self-help junkie. Mm -hmm. Personal development keeps me going because the world is negative and I need something to keep me going. I'm a fan of Jim Rohn, Les Brown, Tony Robbins, and there's this new guy named Eric Thomas. Mr. I want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe. And I remember he said, pain is part of the process. You need to cry or to give up or cry to keep going. I'm already crying. <laughs> I'm at mile 18. I look back, I came pretty far. So I kept going. I hit the wall at mile 18. I cried, I talked myself into it. Mile 19, that happened again. It happened all the way through mile 26, and I turned the corner. I saw the finish line. My mind, I started sprinting. My body, you better stop playing. <laughs> I, I will stop on you right now. If you ever <laughs> so I kept my pace, and I crossed the finish line, and they gave me the medal. Why? I ran a marathon. I hit the wall. I hit so many walls. And you have that reflection moment, it's like the matrix. <laughs> I hit a few walls in life. I remember my girlfriend dumped me after five years. And I laid there in my bed in the fetal position, watching Oprah. <laughs> but I had to keep going with my life. And that year I joined the gym and I lost 50 pounds. I remember my boss telling me, we're closing the barbershop in two months. You have to find another spot. And for two months, I walked around and talked to him and asked questions, what should I do? And I finally talked myself into opening my own business. And this year is my fifth year owning my own business. In life, you're going to be inspired to do something, and you're going to talk yourself into doing something, and you're going to show up, and you keep going, and you're going to hit a wall, because nothing comes easy. But I want you to know, after that wall, it's greatness. If your comfort zone is the danger zone, the wall is the entrance to greatness. What is greatness? 
It's simple. Being the best version that you can be. Going as far as you want to go. And we all have hit some walls in life. Some of you have hit some right now. There were 1.7 spectators at the marathon, and they couldn't run a race for me. But when I hit the wall, I saw the sign. Guys, there's a wall, and there's your greatness. Remember my face. Short, fat, and handsome man. <laughs> With a sign. Keep going. Your greatness is worth it. Keep going. Keep going.
And even when I went to high school, it was like I still had that sign on my back. Talk about me. I could be on one end of the, of the hallway and a, and a student would yell out, hey, Blackie. And all of a sudden, my whole day was changed. But then one day, I said to myself, I had enough. Who are you to tell me that I am not pretty? Who are you to determine my worth? And I went to the bathroom, and I got a mirror. And I looked at myself, and I said, I'm pretty too. And I started to believe those three words. I'm pretty too. I'm here to tell you today that we are all pretty too. And that nobody's reality, no one's opinion should become your reality. So those who raised your hand, that was my story. But I know you have a similar story like mine. But I stand here to tell you today that you're pretty too. This bullying and teasing is just like a cancer. If you don't catch it right away, it eats away at you. It eats away at your self-esteem. eats away at your self-worth. eats away at your self-confidence. But I wanted to create a, just like cancer, they create organizations for people like that, right? To give them money. So I decided to create an organization myself with those same three words. I'm pretty too. So now I have an organization where I help young girls understand how beautiful they are and that they can be unapologetically who they are. Yeah. You don't have to look like the girl in the magazine. You don't have to look like the people you see on Facebook and Instagram. You are pretty too just the way you are. No one wants to be teased. It's a terrible thing. It changes who you are. I looked in the mirror just to show you that I said that I was pretty too. But did I not tell you that it took me to be 25 years old to look in the mirror and say that I was pretty too? Being teased and being bullied, it takes a toll on you. And so I'm not telling you that overnight that you're gonna feel better about yourself. But if you just start today telling yourself that you're worth it, that you're beautiful, that you can be all that you want to be, trust me, just like my vision board, it'll come to life. Because you are just that. So I stand here today again, letting you know that you and you are pretty too. I have one thing I wanted to say, and it's losing my mind right now. <laughs> but I, I do want to say to you guys again, that you are pretty too. Thank you. Our final and sixth contestant is Yvette Beasley. Failure is not an option. Failure is not an option, Yvette Beasley.
<clears throat> courage doesn't always sound like a roar. Sometimes courage is that still small voice that you hear at the end of the day that says, <coughs> I'll try again tomorrow. Those was words that I came across by Mary Ann Ratcher. Good evening, Madam Toastmaster Chair, distinguished Toastmasters, guests, and friends. Failure is not an option. Where did I get that from? Growing up as a young girl in preschool, I remember my mother telling me before I'd walk out the door, baby girl, failure is not an option. You reach for the moon, you'll fall amongst the stars. That's all right by me. Sometimes I'll catch my dad before he walks out the door and he'll grab me and kiss me on my cheek and say, sweetheart, all I want you to do is do your best. That's good enough for me. Those words were instilled in me in preschool, kindergarten, beginning in grammar school. I would hear them every day. I thought I was armed and ready for whatever challenges would come because I knew failure was not an option. Unfortunately, at the age of 13, life took a toll and I had to really find out the true meaning of what those words meant. At the age of 13, my mother was tragically taken away from me. And then my dad, feeling guilt and shame after the events that happened to my mother was absentee. Escorted away by drugs and alcohol, me, my sister, and my brother found ourselves being raised by Granny. Granny was dealing with her own issues. She was sick, she had health problems, and on top of that, grieving the loss of her oldest daughter. And now she had three kids, me, 13, my brother, 11, and my sister, six, to raise and nurture in the absence of a mother and a father. Realizing that failure is not an option, I took on two roles. I was now big sister and mama. Escorting my brother and sister through the trials of life as going into high school and grammar school, we made it day by day, month by month, year by year, we made it because failure is not an option. In high school and in college, I found myself involved in church. I sung in the choir, I taught Sunday school, I even served as the role of a church administrator, scheduling appointments from a pastor, doing a lot of things to keep me busy. It was an outlet to fill the void that I was missing because I needed that nurture of a mother and my grandmother could give me only so much. But I remember the words of my granny coupled with the words of my parents. Granny would say, nothing beats failure but a try. If you don't succeed, do it again. Nothing beats failure but a try. So as I went through my course of life and the various events and obstacles that I faced, I found myself being diverted from my college aspirations. I went to the University of Iowa and I ended up having to come back home because Granny's health took a turn for the worse. And my sister and brother were now in high school and they needed me. Family first, and failure is not an option. I returned home, still determined to work on my college degree. I went to Northwestern Business College and got an associate's degree. Worked, went to school, raised my brother and sister, because failure is not an option. Pursuing those dreams, and I faced obstacles. But I remember my grandmother would say, obstacles, sweetheart, is just things people see when they took their face off the goal. They took their eyes off the goal. So I returned to my failure is not an option. And in August, April of 2013, I went to college. I remember my first day taking that placement test. 
Has anybody ever experienced an anxiety attack? <laughs> Here I am, over 30, not gonna give my age, <laughs> over 30, standing at this door on a Saturday afternoon, and now I have to go in and take a placement test? My transcripts from Northwestern should be good enough. Didn't I appear knowledgeable when we interviewed? But now I have to go in and take a placement test. I grabbed hold to the door, fear shook me. My grandmother used to say, fear is just false evidence appearing real. It grabbed me and I could not open that door. Heart started beating fast and I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And I heard that still voice of my mother, sweetheart, failure is not an option. I stepped back from the door and I took a deep breath. And I said, I can do this. I have the love and the strength of my mother, my father, and my grandmother who have now passed on. I went into that classroom and I walked in and lo and behold, I wasn't the oldest person there. <laughs> there was a lady that was 60 plus sitting on the front row and she looked at me and was like, <laughs> yes, I'll go in. I never stopped from that point forward. I received my bachelor's of science degree. I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in healthcare. Failure is not an option. Obstacles will come. It's your opportunity to look them and say, nope, I got my eyes focused on the prize because failure is not an option. as much time as needed. We need to have complete silence so that our judges can mark their ballots, and then we can speak when we get the clue that all ballots have been collected.
Master Paul Bell, it's a big collection. contestants to please come up front in the order in which you spoke. So I'll interview you in the order in which you spoke. For those table topic contestants that are still present, let's do the interview in the order in which you spoke. Toastmasters for a whopping six months, and uh, in my progress, I have hid successfully up until the last couple of weeks before giving my first three speeches. So I'm just starting my process. Michael has something in here in his profile that every so often I hear this, yet I want to know why he wrote this and what it means to you. Where it says, notable accomplishments Michael wrote down, graduated from college with a four-year degree. <laughs> what does that mean to you, and why was that so important for you to list it as your notable accomplishment? Well, I think all of us have our strengths and weaknesses. Growing up, we know what our strengths are, and we certainly know what our weaknesses are. Mine was weakness was school. I was good on the playground, but not so good in the studies department. So early on, my father said, you'd make a great postman, or something to that effect. So I did this to prove him wrong, that I could actually get to college, graduate. Your face that I've even had an opportunity to compete against in the past. <laughs> Mr. Tim Wilson, let us know which club you're representing, how long you've been in Toastmaster, and what your certification level is. It's pronounced Wilson. But I didn't want to say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme Toastmasters 595201, and I've been with Toastmasters for over 10 years. We can tell the over 10 years because you seem to be pretty comfortable impromptu. So, being impromptu, I'm going to flip this over and I'm going to pull something from here for you, sir. You ready? You ready? Tim. In all of the experiences that you've had in Toastmasters over the last 10 years that you've been involved, tell me, what's your most memorable moment? Of all the experience I've had in Toastmasters over the last <clears throat> 10 years, probably it was winning the district contest when you were the contest master, as I recall. So that's probably the, well, I didn't want to put it down there because it seemed inappropriate, but you brought it up, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, Tim, I must admit that was one of my most memorable times in my Toastmaster career because you did something in that contest that they only write about. And that is, when you get a question in table topics and you don't have a clue what they're asking you, make up an answer anyway for two minutes. And you walked away with the championship that year when you did that. So in honor of your participation tonight, Tim Wilson, I am giving you this certificate of participation along with a token for Easter. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> Mr. Charles Carruthers, give us some feedback on what club you're representing, how long you've been in Toastmasters, and your certification level right now. Really quick, keeping with the table topics thing. Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, one and a half years. Competent leader, I am 
couple of speeches away from my CC, which will be completed by June. <laughs> Charles, you have listed here travel as your interests, as your hobbies. Not only is it listed as travel, but it's in all caps. <laughs> <laughs> what does that actually mean when you say travel? Give us a little bit more feedback there. Being a product of the greatest fighting force in America, known as the United States Navy, I have been privileged and served 23 years. I got to see half of the world. I would do it over and over and over and over and over. My two minutes up yet? Again, if I could. I tell everyone, the young people that I mentor as part of the organization that I'm with, if you don't have any idea of where to go after high school, not college, or you don't have employment, the military is a great place to start. Now, it's not for everyone, but it's a great place to start. And I'm glad I started there. Thank you for serving our country in the Navy, which um, I can't see. And also, Thank you for participating tonight in the Table Topics Contest. Here is your certificate of participation along with your token gift in honor of Easter. Thank, Thank you. you. As we go to our final contestant that's being interviewed for the Table Topics Contest, Miss <laughs> Cynthia Sharp. Cynthia, <laughs> club, year, certification. Blue Cross Blue Shield, club two, three years, CC and advanced leader bronze. Now when you came up for the contest, you and I had a moment there. <laughs> you almost didn't want to let my hand go. <laughs> Did you find in that moment you were able to use the energy that you were feeling and put it into your presentation? And if so, how did you manage to do that? Thank you for noticing that. You know, as I was walking up and aware of the question, I felt a sense that time was slowing down a little bit and that I was relishing it. Every second, I was looking around because I wanted to imprint this into my brain. I wanted to remember, and by the time I got up here and shook your hand, the woman that I saw a few years ago, went, man, I want to be like her. She's amazing. I felt so much emotion. I thought I was going to lose my composure on the spot. And I had to just hang on for just a second and just let it all come into the cells of my body. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But, you know, I think... My, my, for lack of a better word, what I, I do when I'm coming for table topics is the most important thing, I think, is to connect, to be very connected to, I don't, you know, if you're a Christian, it's the Holy Spirit, if you're, you're whatever, all that is, it's being connected and just being present, just being right here, right now. I had no idea what I was going to say, I just knew that I needed to connect and let it just flow out, so I think holding your hand for that second She's a great, sing a great, you know, handshake here. It's nice and strong. I like it. I think it did kind of connect, just kind of ground me just slightly. Even though I felt the ground to come out, but it did make a difference for me. And I appreciate you letting me do that. Thank you. Yeah, Les Brown liked my handshake too when he met me a few years ago. He's like, wow, she has an awesome handshake. That's awesome. So I'm glad that my handshake was <coughs> there to help ground you. And more importantly, I'm glad that you were able to connect in your message, as well as to connect with your participation in this year's Central North Division Table Topics Contest. Cynthia, here's your certificate of participation, along with your gift for Easter. Thank you. Contestants, which now leads me into interviews for international speech contestants. Right. Everyone from the international speech contest, come on up and line up as the table topic contestants did in the order in which you spoke. Mm -hmm. 
Seven, seven, five, two. Did you know here? Because you know, I want you to save your voice. So give me an opportunity. Club, how many years certification? I'm just going to have a little Toastmasters. Five, seven, five, two. Over five years, I have a CC and a CF. Oh, Ying, I see here that one of your notable accomplishments is being second place in the District 30 International Speech Contest. And I think I was there that day to see you because I remember your knees knocking. You jumped from the airplane. This time, though, you talk about having a crush on a girl. That's why you were at that marathon. And that's what started it all. Have any other influences happened in your life because of a girl? <laughs> this time is because of a guy. <laughs> he introduced me to Toastmasters in 2009. His name is Keith Washington. And he said he won a speech contest. And I said, I can do that too. <laughs> and I showed up and I was nervous. And there's a guy named Don Campbell in my club who signed me up without my permission. <laughs> so I said, I'll show him. And I, I, I'm addicted to competing because I like being nervous. I, I, don't, I enjoy not being able to sleep before the contest. <laughs> but now, another pretty girl came into our club. She said, will you be my mentor? And I said, yes. <laughs> so I, I started from the bottom, and now I'm here. <laughs> Yvette Beasley, tell us, club, 
number of years, and certification level. I'm with Toastmasters of Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. I've been in Toastmasters for two and a half years, and I've completed my Advanced Communicator Bronze and Advanced Leader Silver. Yvette, you talked a lot in your presentation about family. And I remember going through high school, my best friend went through a situation very, very similar to what happened with your family. The key difference to me, though, in your story versus hers was the fact that your brothers and sisters seem to still be talking to you. <laughs> Tell us, through your journey of going through everything that you've gone through, experiencing living out failure is not an option, how has that truly impacted the lives of your brother and sister? Well, it has, that was something that was core to us as we were growing up. And my sister and I, we may look alike, but we're night and day. And she, her path was a little bit more rough than mine. And throughout all the courses and all the challenges, she continued to get up and get back up. Even though she would get knocked down, maybe because of a choice of her own, she would always get back up because she knew that there was something better, that failure is not an option and I can't settle for this. So now she's doing well, she's married, she's got two boys, they live in Texas, she works for the VA hospital, and I'm very proud of her. My brother as well, we all took some turns that we may not have been proud of, but we held to the fact yeah. that failure is not an option. We're going to shake the dust off and keep it moving. What you did tonight in this contest, Yvette Bailey, or Beasley, Yvette Beasley, thank you so much. I don't know where I'm getting Bailey from. Yeah, Miss Beasley, thank you for participating, but don't walk away. Because you have your certificate of participation for being in the international speech contest, and now you have your token, your gift, and honor of Easter. Thank Congratulations. You. this down and that means for me I get an opportunity to take a rest from the microphone and bring back up our Central North Division Governor. She along with her team will be eager to present to us tonight the winners and make announcements for the Table Topics and International Speech Contest. Everyone, great. Was she good or what? section on the agenda. That's because there are a few awards that we need to give out. First of all, in addition to Cassandra, I would like to call up my contest chair. You guys really love the whole international thing, all the decorations and everything. Just so you guys know, I'm not that creative. No, 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 I got a team. And the person who puts together the wonderful newsletter that we send out each month, that's my contest chair. Let me invite up Stephanie Seisel.
few clubs. Is anybody from Loop Trust Masters? Hey! I know I heard it. <laughs> Loop Trust Masters achieved the five star achievement yeah. in December. And we want to make sure that they get their award. So Bill Morrill is representing Loop Trust Masters. Yeah!
the winners. You guys ready to hear the winners? Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're going to start with table topics. Our third place winner for table topics.